Please. <laughs> His wife constructed wonderful cookies. <laughs> uh, when they had that house up on uh, Shepherd Street, why, uh, it was a big brick modern house, and everybody said, you know, parent particularly, my God, what's that thing? Because I mean, it's all around surrounded by, you know, old, old homes. Uh, his son, Thomas, I uh, went to school with him, and uh, he was still here, uh, another fellow who used to go and play. He, and his mother would make cookies. And he had them, so, uh, it was wonderful. Do yeah. you know where he is? I do not know where Palmer is. No, no. Uh, I do not know. Does anyone know? He's in Portland. Portland area. Portland area. Portland area. Uh, lost contact, contact yeah. with him. Yeah, it, it's my understanding that probably quite a bit of uh, entertaining at the house as well. There were a lot of social societies at the time, and she yeah. did a, a great deal of, of entertaining there, yeah. too. And if you're looking for Palmer, he goes by the name of Charles Street. Charles Street? Charles. He's Charles now. He Charles, Charles Palmer. Charles, Charles Palmer. So you know him as Palmer. I know him as Palmer, but he now goes by Charles. Oh, my goodness, Charles. So yeah. if you're looking for him... Okay. You'll find him, I think, probably in financial circles. Yes. Okay. That's not strange. <laughs> what what kind of is there any kind of feedback mechanism from the public uh, to a firm such as Harriman's? Uh, is there any kind of responsiveness to public tastes or uh, just what is that? Yeah. Is there, is, is there something like that? that? That's an interesting question. And, um, the idea of, of who, who's, who's, uh, who really dictates what style is acceptable to, to the public. I think it's a tug of war oftentimes. Uh, architects fancy themselves as, as being on the avant-garde, or they, many of them try to be on the avant-garde of, of design. Uh, and so as, as, as they see themselves as part artist. Uh, and I think oftentimes you'll have some clients who are very receptive to that. And I suppose it's, it's you know a sampling of uh, just about everyone uh, in society. Some are very receptive, some are more conservative, uh, and some are in the middle. And so, so my guess is that most architecture falls uh, along those lines as well. You'll have some people that allow uh, the architect free reign with, the, with the, their expression, and then others who would say, no, I, I'd like to have it look like this. I think there was an example or a story of um, Margaret Chase Smith, uh, Alonzo did a, a couple houses for her, and she said, you'll design it the way I want you to, or I'll find myself another architect. Uh, and so, and, and, as, as she could, could say. Uh, and so that's ultimately, I think, what, what uh, really sometimes underlies, um, it's, it's who's holding the money, because otherwise uh, it's, it's just a hobby, uh, as they say. So. Does that, does that, uh, yeah, that, that helps. A little bit, did it? I, uh, that struck me when I saw Auburn Hall on the screen. Yeah. And that's a public building. Uh, that in particular might be subject to uh, pressures. Uh, but yeah. I, I personally uh, am very pleased with the way it is modern, yet it reflects the neighboring uh, yeah. original Auburn Hall. And I'll just bring it bring it up for a second here. I think in so Auburn, I wondered, I wondered you might not have been uh, privy to uh, the uh, adoption of the design uh, the, by the city. Yeah, th there was very little actually. Um, uh, there was there was very little in terms of the the change from the original design to this on Auburn Hall. Uh, some communities, Portland, uh, has a, a very tight uh, grip on what uh, is constructed in, in the more historic areas. Uh, and, uh, and so it also depends on the community that you're working in. Uh, Portland, again, has a, has, it has a, a lot that's uh, said about it, and they'll tell you what they want to see and what they don't want to see. And so that, that can be um, pretty tricky at times. Uh, and, but most communities, um, or zoning ordinances don't dictate style. And so you really, uh, unless there's uh, some, unless you're attaching to a historic property, uh, then, then there may be some pressure on there. But otherwise, I think it, it's uh, kind of a, a give and take uh, with clients. I will say that nowadays it's a lot easier uh, to imagine what the finished 
product or building is going to be. Um, it's, it's not a leap of faith from a sketch on a board or a watercolor to the final thing. That, that, that there's the, the ability to model the things pretty accurately nowadays uh, has, has sort of um, uh, made it a little easier to communicate the design intent uh, to the client. Uh, so, but, but uh, yeah, that, that's, that's always, um, and I think it changes uh, as you go through your career. Uh, there are, uh, when you're starting out, you're just lucky to, to be able to, to do some design, and, and so you're a little timid, and as you get older, you, you get a little bolder, and you um, push the envelope a little further. So, so they, they call it an old man's profession. <laughs> Thank you. I, was, uh, I had a question that was similar along those lines, where I noticed that, that, you know such a distinct break in style between the work that Alonzo did for Bates, and then the schools that he was designing in that more modern style where you really get the feeling that he was constrained by the, the uh, administration right. uh, to stay within a certain style and that he didn't have much le creative leeway and that uh, as soon as that came to a close uh, he really said, you know, this is my chance, I'm going to break free and, uh, you know, yeah. and go ahead. Get it. Uh, there's an interesting sort of case study at, at Bates. The, the, the Harriman era kind of ended uh, when the Ladd Library came on the scene, uh, and so I don't know how you, many of you are familiar with that, but that was that was Walter Gropius's firm, the, the Architects Collaborative, uh, TAC, that did the Ladd Library, and so the last building prior to that was uh, was probably Lane may have been, uh, and then all of a sudden uh, this this uh, very modern uh, building uh, comes in and, and not only just disrupts the architectural style, disrupts the fabric of the city. The, the Bardwell Street was, was stopped at that point, uh, and this was imposed right in the center of the campus. Uh, and so, uh, and so, there's a really important stylistic shift at Bates at that time. They've never actually, um, I don't know, if they ever recovered from that. They, they kind of swung back a little bit. Uh, and the, the more recent dining commons is is probably the pushed. Uh, pushes a little bit more contemporary, <coughs> but you're right. The firm itself, I, I was when I was researching, I wondered, uh, was Alonzo was he more uh, reserved, and because because he uh, his his uh, uh, roots went back to uh, Bath and to learning the trade through his uncle, uh, and so was he more more in the classical tradition. And was it Gatt or someone else that was was sort of more at the forefront of some of these? But I don't think so. I, I think uh, he probably had a hand in the style of the very modern looking schools that he did. And it may have been born more out of uh, efficiency and cost than it really was had anything to do necessarily with, with uh, his uh, preference for one style or another. Uh, the, the big thing that Harriman would come in to do, or come into a, he, would, he would come to a school board and he would say to them, and he have have the material that I passed around, I can build you a building for X dollars a square foot. And, and, and they, you know, they blew, blew away any of the competition and it's like, well, uh, yeah, uh, you know. So, so it, was, it was probably more because he was a very astute businessman uh, than he had necessarily a preference for one side or another. But, yeah, that, that's very true. Uh, he, he developed systems, uh, structural systems, as you say, for repetition uh, where he could and uh, bring in the daylight. In those days, we didn't have to worry about heating the mm -hmm. uh, heat losses, it was gaining the heat from the sun. But also, uh, and so he also was very concerned with maintenance. Mm. Uh, he had put money into the toilets, like you wouldn't believe, <laughs> to have sure. ceramic tile, good functioning fixtures, and good hardware in the doors, yeah. they would last a lifetime. They're probably still working 50 <laughs> years later <laughs> because that's where he understood where the wear and tear was. Yeah. And so he, he had a good balance, I think. That's, that's, that's interesting. There was one uh, bit of research I was doing where he actually was analyzing the different uh, shapes of, uh, of gymnasiums. And so he, he sat there and, and looked at if you had a domed uh, or a vaulted roof that came down and, and eliminated most of the exterior wall that you could save a certain amount of cost by doing that. And so that was actually so many dollars a square foot cheaper in terms of the construction of a, of a school than, than doing it uh, with a flat roof or with a pitch roof. And so 
So yeah, he, he really um, broke it down to that level of detail. Um, I'll make this comment about the architect's choice in style. When you're dealing with college campuses and buildings that have been developing over a period of 150, 200 years, you've got a setting uh, in which your building has to fit. Current day schools or schools built in the last 30, 40 years since the regionalization uh, movement <clears throat> are often freestanding on large sites where you have enough room for playing fields so you don't have the confines of the setting. Yep. And um, some commercial buildings are not in downtown, they're out in peripheral areas. So you have a lot, a great deal more latitude. Uh, you're in effect creating the style for for that area in contrast with uh, rather limiting factors in an existing college campus. Contrast Bowdoin or Bates or whatever with a new campus like University of Maine Augusta, mm -hmm. uh, where it's starting from scratch. Right. Or or not. Um, so it's yeah. a lot of it is dictated by. You're, you're right. The, you. the, the context certainly does play an important role, and there are different attitudes about context. If you look at the that image of the People's Bank, uh, where it was all glass, uh, or even thinking about Copley Square in Boston, right, where, where the uh, John Hancock Tower comes in, and, and it's a monolithic glass. And how does that respond to its context of, of sort of the Romanesque church right next to it? Or how did the People's Bank glass building respond to the historic architecture on Lisbon Street? And so, so there are a lot of different attitudes about, about what context means, too, uh, in architecture, and how appropriate is it to, uh, to either follow the same, it, it, there's sort of that line, uh, before which it kind of snaps, you can, you can look exactly like it, you can look a little bit like it, and you get to the point where, where maybe you know, it, it doesn't work anymore because uh, you moved a little too far away. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a great point. The context plays a, a big role in, in uh, sort of um, our understanding of how something fits in stylistically with its neighbors. How much of, it, how much of, the, of the work was done by uh, doing competitions and how much was done by negotiated contracts? Uh, the, the work at Bates, uh, my guess is that, uh, that he was in pretty tight uh, over there with the president and so uh, I don't think he had a lot of competition to do. Uh, the other thing is that uh, as you develop, and, and Harriman had, at the time, they, they had, they were rolling in, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know who the competition was in schools, I guess uh, Ingalls was, but, but he was, uh, he was a, I don't know if he worked for Harriman for any yes, time, he did. Uh, and Dean Weir. And Dean Weir, and, and so they started to look exactly like the Harriman yeah. school buildings, and Phil, Phil Ray to a degree as well, later on. Uh, the, um, nowadays, the, uh, it's about, I was going to say it's probably about 60 40. 60% 60 competition, 40% is, is through uh, uh, connections and relationships. Uh, and so, uh, and it was no different then, which is, which is why most firms become very regional. It's hard to break out of being a very regional firm uh, because uh, the relationships uh, uh, and work that you've done support uh, more work going forward. So, uh, at the time, I, I don't know, Bob, how much of the work when you were there was, uh, was competition-based in terms of you had to, to compete against other firms versus someone calling up and saying, give us an office building. Well, I think most, most clients would really do several architects. And uh, depending, and that competition depends on minor details or just in one day interview or it could be more. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but for some clients, like the telephone company, we didn't mention that, but we did all the work in the New England Telephone Company for 20 years, uh, just by, we call us up and did another job. Did another job. Shaw's. 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 But we had to perform yeah. so that they could go back to their bosses and say, this is still economical. This is uh, it, it's still each job you had to be able to perform. Yeah. 